Hi, welcome to No Filter Dubai. This is a chat with Karim Ibrahim um, from Robocom VR on the metaverse, VR worlds, and what he's up to in Dubai Mall and here in Dubai with some of the VR technologies he's working on. Karim, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, John. So very quickly, what is Robocom VR and how did you get into it? What's your story? Uh, in a few words, Robocom VR is a VR gaming company. Uh, we started our business in, um, in the hardware sector of, uh, or the hardware part of uh, the industry. Uh, since we were a Middle Eastern company and uh, since the industry in general was new, uh, it lacked infrastructure in the region and whatnot, we decided to uh, uniquely position ourselves by creating hardware in instead of creating software or content for, for that part because uh, we thought you know the competition would be um, would be massive, uh, let alone uh, being uh, starting from a third world country and whatnot. So uh, we went into the business as a hardware company. Uh, we soon we soon evolved to be uh, a turnkey solution of sorts. We do uh, now we we now do the the content itself. We do the software. We do the hardware. We do the operations, and we have transformed ourselves in the last couple of years to be the largest gaming company in the Middle East now. So, in a few okay. words. So, <laughs> when did all this start? Because right now everyone's obviously talking about the metaverse, which is kind of a, a new phrase. Mm -hmm. A lot of people that weren't previously are looking at VR. Correct. But you were starting on this a couple of years ago, presumably. So, when Correct. did you get into this? Correct. How much R and D was involved? What yeah. was the lead up involved? How did you really build this out to, uh, to making it popular today? Of course, of course. Uh, it's a very good question, John. See, um, terminology. Uh, uh, or, or you know the, the the lingo behind it now. Everything is uh, right. A, a, everything right. has a term now. NFT, blockchain, metaverse. You know, metaverse always existed. If if you had made a, um, uh, you know, Minecraft, all these games that existed way back when, they're all even Sims. It's a metaverse. A metaverse is, is just in simple terms a, a, a virtual world that you would build on your own. Now, uh, blockchain technology and NFT have gave it a lot more importance or uh, the transcendence of what metaverse can be now that VR is available uh, is making the metaverse more valuable you know as a, as a term uh, as a word uh, if I were to explain it or if, if I were to say what our version of the metaverse is when we first start started our, our machinery we worked in flight simulation our first project was was in flight simulation now when we did flight simulation you had to create a world to support that simulator in itself. So the, uh, the concept of the metaverse had orig originated from the, the flight simulation. Now, creating this flight simulation, we had a kind of a generic Star Wars game, and you were supposed to go into the spaceship and then you know blast your enemies and whatnot. And we, we built these worlds, and we built these enemies, and we built these characters. And then it started growing. Uh, it started growing into something much more. It's like every time you felt like you know, you were angry or you're pissed off or whatever and you want to blow some steam instead of going to the gym, it would be like, oh, let me get in the flight simulator and blow some people up. So we started coining a, a term for it, you know, you know, space invaders and whatnot and let's enter this metaverse. And then we would talk amongst ourselves saying that if we built an X simulator or, or like a racing simulator or a shooting simulator or, or, or whatever simulator that that metaverse would it, again be associated with with that fantasy or that virtual world or whatever it's like some people are into zombies some people are in aliens whatever you want you can go, go towards that direction uh, now i think when it all came together was um we had a project or we we are undergoing a project right now in abu dhabi and uh, it's called uh, pixel al Kana. it's actually the largest gaming center in the in the region if if not um, the whole of asia uh, we have a, it, it, it's, it's condensed to four halls. You have a digitized event space. You have a, a gaming uh, sort of FMB center. Uh, you have a esports certified esports academy. And the fourth, last but not least, it's uh, the first ever open world cross platform VR simulation. It sounds complicated. It's not. It's just a whole bunch of simulators in one world. And to coin what the metaverse meant to us, it was like instead of instead of creating these. Uh, these worlds, these individualistic <laughs> worlds. Why don't Why don't you create one singular world, one singular metaverse, and have uh, these simulators act as a portal to the, this singular metaverse? So, you would enter via if if you were to want to race, and if I were to want to come in a helicopter, and my friend were to want to shoot something, we can all be in different simulators, but in in one metaverse. And that's where our concept or our version of the metaverse started growing into what it is now.
our generation probably remember going to the arcade. I don't remember, I don't know if kids still do that nowadays. But you were talking about going to your um, location in Abu Dhabi or in Dubai, getting into a rig, which I think is what the Ready Player One types call it, and you know, playing with your friends in this rig where you can feel momentum, you can, you, you know, you can move your body depending on whatever machine you're in in, in virtual reality. And that kind of gives you an experience you can't have at home. Because you know, there's that, you know, in the early days in the 90s, you go to an arcade to play video games, and then you kind of had Sony, Nintendo, all these others, you play at home because it's better. Seems what you're suggesting is that to really get the best, most immersive VR experience now, you kind of have this, have this hybrid where you can go with your friends, get into, a, get into this rig, and have a kind of depth of immersion that you can't have anywhere else. Fantastic question, John, fantastic question. Uh, I remember when, um, when I first grew up, I grew up in the States, uh, grew up in Los Angeles, and as a pastime activity, there, there, was, there was a place called Chuck E. Cheese, you know, Chuck E. Cheese? <laughs> yeah, of course. You're familiar with Chuck E. Cheese. I remember it was like every weekend my parents would give us a couple bucks and then go play at Chuck E. Cheese, and me and my friends eat pizza, play all day, House of Dead, uh, Space Invaders, Pac-Man. It was just, it was so socially, um, you know, you would, you would hang out with your friends, it was, just, it was different, right? And then all of a sudden, um, you know, as you were saying, the home console came in and everything, and everything kind of just stopped growing, right? Uh, it stopped, people stopped investing or people stopped innovating location-based entertainment because the market share uh, had to follow suit, you know, everyone was investing now in consoles, everyone was about, you know, your phone, about Nintendo, about uh, PlayStation, and then their monetization would come from the online platform, uh, but the 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 the, the barrier to, the barrier to uh, to entry was now different. It was that you needed a console or you needed a phone or something to be to feel connected. But it's not the case, you know. You can't play football while while sitting at home. You can't play basketball while sitting at home. You cannot become an NBA player by playing a mobile, uh, 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 an NBA game or uh, a basketball game on your mobile app. There needs to be a transition, there needs to be practice. You need to actually suit up, practice, go to the gym, go to the field, play some competitions to work your way up to actually compete. Now, what gaming, what gaming did for us uh, when, it turned to, to, uh, when it turned home, it kind of broke that social interactivity, the physical social interactivity. We no longer needed to meet somewhere to play with each other. It was like, you can stay home and I can stay home. And if so, the, if the publisher decides to do a LAN event and then we are lucky enough to be ranked or whatever, and then we can go there. So everyone followed the money. You know, every, and, and when we first went in the industry, we didn't want to follow the money. We wanted to break boundaries, you know, we wanted to, uh, uh, you know, because if you follow the money, you're always going to be limited within, you're going to think inside the box. We wanted to think outside the box. We noticed an industry that had, and, and that's another reason why some people called us crazy. They're like, I remember our investors saying, so you're telling me you want me to invest in a, in a 50 some thousand dollar machine in theme parks or FEC centers where people no longer go to and they can play in their game and X, Y, Z. And I said, yes, why? Because all they need to know is they can only get this experience here and th they'll forget their PlayStation and they'll forget their Xbox. You have to remember you're using your thumbs. How primitive is it as a gamer, you know? If you tell me all oh, the most fantastic, like go back to the gla gladiator days, you know, in the Roman Empire and, and you, oh, they didn't use their thumbs, they had to use their bodies. They had to use, you know, they had to feel something. So imagine instead of, um, Let's, say, let's take League of Legends or Valorant, for example. Instead of actually using your thumbs or a screen or a mouse or a cursor or whatever, you actually had a rig where you entered their metaverse, right? And you physically competed and you physically did spells and potions and all of that. And the, the, whole, the whole gaming landscape would change. If it's a $200 billion industry right now, can you, can you imagine it in 10, 15 years if you add that level of immersion to gaming, what type of industry it would be? I don't know if you saw the CEO of Epic Games, but a couple of weeks ago, I think, or over, just over a week ago, said that the metaverse was a hundred trillion dollar industry. I would not which, be surprised. Which, you know, made everyone take notice. But yeah, I, I mean, you know, I can imagine pitching hardware to investors just a couple of years ago, or even 18 months ago. And you know, there's this debate within the tech scene that there's so much emphasis on software, apps, that kind of thing that the hardware often gets left behind, or what you have is a massive big tech players building out all the hardware, so as you said, no one else can move in. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Transformers, because I know you've done something interesting on that, 
a little bit about where you see the metaverse going and also a little bit about esports um, because I, there's been one or two references to that kind of thing. You know, you just mentioned Gladiators. But just to begin with, you've been, you've kind of got this Transformers game and it's interesting because you've combined the rig with some pretty unique IP. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and introduce it? So, um, going back to the early days with the investors and trying to sell a dream that no one, no one wanted to invest in, it was, um, you know, w once you show s someone what can be done, you know, everyone will follow suit, everyone will then believe in the idea. So, th in the early days, we had to take a couple of risks. We built a prototype, it was the generic version of the Star Wars I told you about. And I remember we were pitching it to Ahmad, and Ahmad was like, you're a Lebanese company, man. We got, we got Warner Brothers, we got The Walking Dead, we got John Wick, we got, wh who are you guys? I, I said, just try this, the machine. If you like it, you like it. You don't, you don't like it, you don't like it. They tried the machine, they fell in love, and they decided to take, uh, take a chance on us. We ended up being the highest performing entertainment device in the history of Dubai Mall per square meter. So usually how theme parks or FEC centers uh, uh, calculate the revenue is per square meter. Because we had such a compact device, uh, so, for example, if the roller coaster had made a million dollars per month, the roller coaster would actually take 1,200 meters of space and would cost $13 million to invest in. Where our simulator would make $200,000, like eight of them would make $200,000, but you only needed 60, 70 meters of space and you needed a fraction of, of that investment. Uh, with, with that being the case, we had a, a proven business model. So we decided, why not knock on some doors? Why not give it some shelf life? Because you don't want to be a fad. You don't want, you want to be like, and, and I'm sure you've all seen the, the Chinese VR uh, eggs that are, are in every mall or, or the cheap or gimmicky VR. So we didn't want to be the cheaper or Jimmy, uh, gimmicky VR fad that came into the market. So what we decided to do is we decided to tie it in uh, or synchronize it with a brand that could extend its shelf life. We knocked a couple of doors. Of course, some people would refuse us, given that we were a Lebanese company. We were only a year old at the time. Uh, luckily for us, Hasbro, actually, I'm not going to take you through all the details of how we were able to close the deal, but Hasbro actually did end up giving us a chance. And they said on, on the contingency that if you work for two years and we end up not liking the game, all the money you spent, all the time you spent, has to you throw it out the window. It's going to be solely on the approval of the game itself. We said, OK, we're willing to take that risk. And we spent about two years building a game, and uh, the, the, the so wait, you hired de developers, game developers, so, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> well, you, you developed your own IP. Oh, exactly. It was kind of licensed out by Hasbro. Exactly. So so in the beginning, we used to outsource from Finland because we we didn't know how to make games, and, and plus it's not easy to find some. Yeah, game. it's a completely different. It no. is. And uh, as soon as we, we, we acquired Hasbro, they, they had a very strict policy that you could not outsource the development of the game. Uh, so we had to, like we were forced to, to make our, the game in-house. So we ended up hiring like 50, 60 devs. Uh, of these developers, half of them were architects and interior designers. And everyone's like, why are you hiring ar architects and interior designers? I said, if you look at the software they use before it gets game ready and goes to Union or uh, sorry Unity or Unreal, uh, it, they're all they're all using either 3D Max or or, or, or whatever 3D uh, 3D. Some people use Grasshopper, whatever 3D software they're using, and the biggest problem that we saw in VR at that time was scalability. You would see these buildings that looked funny, and you would see the streets, and they weren't. They weren't professional-looking streets or, or, or real-life looking buildings. So while whilst building the city, uh, we actually got real architects. And these people, they loved conceptual. They didn't really care about the building being made. They just cared about designing a building. So we gave them that platform. And, and through that platform, they were able to uh, you know, uh, use their creativity to build this Transformers-looking world. And from there, we got a couple of juniors that we did a couple of, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, you know the one, the free ones that Unity has online, like the workshops. <laughs> so they started learning how to make these game-ready uh, assets, and then use the low polygon count so it won't have a like. And then just it was trial and error for us. Uh, luckily, luckily for us, after we launched, they were so impressed with the game. Transformers was so impressed with the game, and for the first time, they realized as a toy manufacturer that you have to remember that this company started as making toys, right? Plastic. And then all of a sudden it evolved into Yeah, you know, and there's animation. the Marvel case study and 100%. What, what is it? Is it yeah, I mean, you know, the movie case study hundred percent. Which 100%. actually started Marvel Studios. It did. Because they looked at what Hasbro did with that and, and thought, then they Whoa, went that direction. This is a massive money maker. It kicked off 
100%. a lot of the whole Marvel business model. Hundred percent. They said that it was, uh, and and as you You've know, done that in VR, which is pretty interesting. And and the thing is, uh, I think what made us what made us unique, John, is now the, the movies is only one transcendence of, of of the brand. Where where does it stop, or where does it where does it continue for that matter? You know, with us. We had given the brand the ability for the first time ever to actually be inside a Transformers character, to actually function as a robot through this flight simulator, of course. So for them, it was like you're, you're prolonging the brand for another 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah, I mean, it's very smart. And mm -hmm. of course, like you obviously understood your audience here in Dubai very well as well, because you of know, course. All the kids love Optimus Prime. Everyone loves Transformers. It's the here. only, not so. the only, of course, not the only. It's one of the few brands that's multi generation. Yeah. Like the <laughs> grandfather, the father, and the son will all know the character. Yeah, so it was a really yeah. good choice of, you know, licensed, it was, licensed it was. content. But it's great that you've got, you know, you've had that experience of, pretty unique experience of mm -hmm. VR rigs combining it with in house development and kind of licensed IP like Transformers. That's, that's a pretty good combination. Uh, and you know, uh, I, I can't speak, uh, I'm under uh, very strict NDAs at the moment, but uh, very soon in 2022, you're going to see a lot of brands that have entrusted us now through, of course, the business model or the case study of Transformers that we were able to, you know, proof of concept. And now you would be surprised at the brands that are signed with us to, again, to uh, innovate or to evolve the brand into the eyes of the character, the P being in the POV of, of the character itself. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of an easy sell. Okay, so kind of a couple of quick questions. So we talked about all of this stuff, mm -hmm. and I think one of the, the points on the metaverse is a lot of people don't exactly know how to define it, you know? They don't know if it's VR, they don't know if, if it's something they can access on their desktop, on their phone. And I think, you know, individuals like Mark Zuckerberg and others are talking about this kind of these metaverse worlds that you can access over different devices, you know, laptop, your phone, whatever. But for me, uh, and I think actually I might be in a minority, but it's a growing kind of audience. I've always been fascinated by VR. I've mm. always been fascinated by the idea of occupying that avatar, mm. being, being that character. And of course, you know, there's all sorts of there's, there's all sorts of barriers to entry, cost of ads that you know, latency, all that kind of stuff. But do you use, do you think VR will it will stay in the arcade, so you'll have the hardware rigs, and also increasingly enter the home? And also, what do you think, and I think this is a really important connection, um, is going to happen with the play-to-earn gaming and VR? Because at the moment, I, I don't know what's happening in that space. I don't know if there's much synergy, but that seems like it's a, you know, it, it would make sense if things went in that direction. In my, in my uh, humble opinion, uh, the next leader of VR is going to be a person who thinks out. It, it's, and I don't mean to say this, you know, live on camera, but I don't think it's Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, he's a very successful person. He's, uh, you know, he is. He's a visionary. He, he knows how to see a trend. But there's just, it's like blockchain. You know, it's based on decentralization, and now everyone wants to centralize decentralization. It's just, you know, it, there's a philosophy behind the metaverse. So if I were to compare a metaverse, it's like going to a different country. Some people love to go to Berlin, or some people love to go to London. Some no, people I get that completely. I mean, right? I, a lot of the time it's confusing because the tech press kind of talk about the metaverse as if it's almost a social media company already. Exactly, right? I don't, and I kind it's of, the I, opposite I, of that. I, yeah, yeah, I almost think like it's a completely different culture slash philosophy, but very few people seem to talk about that. They seem to see particularly elements of the tech press, like it's the social media world going 3D. Yeah. It's like saying that uh, Hollywood is the uh, is the inventor of trends, you know? It's like it's just it's so shallow, you know, that it, it's just there's so much more depth to what you really see, you know? Uh, uh, Facebook has bad blood in in the industry per se. You're not going to go to the metaverse because you want people to know what you're doing or you 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 you, you want to go socialize or do x or y or z. You might want to go to the metaverse for the, for the contrary reason to escape. You know, just like some people go to hike on a retreat or yoga or or the gym. Uh, the way we see the metaverse is just our version of how our country should uh, uh, how the uh, ju ju so, uh, how the Okay, so simpli to simplify things, you can be living in a first world country, London, uh, a city, New York, whatever, and you can 
decide when you have a couple of bucks, you can decide to go to Bali or Vietnam or Philippines and you would enjoy going there so much more than you would if you were to go to Dubai. Or it, It's a preference, right? So the metaverse is the same exact way. Uh, our version of the metaverse is actually going to have a time limit. So you're not allowed to stay more than three hours. If you've ever seen that movie for Justin Timberlake, it's called In Time. In Time, yeah. yeah but yeah. he dies if he runs out of time. So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you don't die if yeah. your headset dies. <laughs> but, but, but the whole point is uh, you need to have some ethical boundaries. You need to have a philosophy behind it. Uh, the metaverse needs to function specifically for that type of audience. Yeah, it's definitely a good idea for kids. You know, yeah. you time out after an hour or so. And it'll give you so much more reason. Like, for example, okay, you love playing football. Can you sit in the football court and play 24 okay, hours a day? I want to ask you about this. Yeah. So, um, you know, you've mentioned kind of gaming tournaments and esports, mm -hmm. and obviously there is that that dream, and I'm not sure it's quite yet that of being able to, you know, have a Jedi fight mm -hmm. in VR or being able to play tennis yeah. and really train in a way that's mm -hmm. very dangerous in the real world, extreme sure. sports or existing sports, even have a football team mm -hmm. on rigs in the future. Um, you know, at your place in Abu Dhabi. Mm. How far away do you think that is? And what do you think is going to happen to competitive esports in VR? Yeah. You were asking, you just asked a good question uh, uh, right now. You were saying about where is VR going to be? Is it going to be in the home? Is it going to be in location base? Is it going to be X, Y, Z? It, it's going to be everywhere. It's just the functionality of each one is going to be differently. So. For example, maybe the VR, the home VR headset would have limited functionality. It'll be made for speculation. It'll be made more for a limited functionality, you know, to, to, to watch matches, maybe to just walk around a little bit, do, do minor things. And your heavy lifting, you know, your, your big competitions or races or F1 or flights or sabers or whatever uh, is all going to happen in a location base. And that's why we in ourselves are very unique. So we've already signed and we're in, under development in, in four major locations around the world. New York being one, New York, New Jersey being one of them. In the American Dream Mall, we have Abu Dhabi, and, and we now have Dubai. And there's another one that I can't disclose at the moment, but it's also in, in, in Southeast Asia. And the way they're supposed to function is you have it's like a back end and front end. Okay, your front end is going to be your location base where the ultimate, the elite, the, uh, the you know the, the the gladiators will have to go compete there. And your your back end or, or is going to be mostly your spectators and your everyday customers. And, and you know you 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 come in, you come out, maybe like go watch a party or a show or whatever for a couple of hours, you chat with your friends and then leave. You know, there's going to be two levels to it. It's the same way. I would love to be a professional football player. It doesn't mean I'm going to be a professional football player. I would love to be a, a, a famous artist. It doesn't mean I'm going to be famous. It, these rules also need to apply in the metaverse. Not to create inequality or, 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 or just like different classes, but to, to, to create comp uh, your natural competitiveness, you know, that there needs to be a certain roadmap for you to achieve success in the metaverse. The same way that there were, if you want to be an entrepreneur in Dubai, it's different than you, if you want to be an entrepreneur in Lebanon. It's different than you if you want to be an entrepreneur in Los Angeles. These rules also need to apply in the metaverse. Maybe you want to be a virtual lawyer. You know, you want to open a virtual law firm in the metaverse. You would have to then create these AIs that would... Yeah, I mean, know? that's in sci-fi <laughs> literature as well. You know, it's like a competitive place. Yeah. Um, okay, two questions to finish up. The first is, based on what you just said, mm. um, I'm not sure if you're allowed to talk about it or not, but have you thought about the idea of building a kind of metaverse world that's accessible from outside your amusement parks, but you can, you know, you can go and you can use the rigs and you can play competitively in these worlds. It's kind of connected to your physical domains. Correct. And then secondly, just for everyone who's listening, you know, where can they go and check out your stuff here in Dubai or in Abu Dhabi? So uh, to answer your first question, definitely, most definitely, there needs to be two, there two types of VR. There needs to be your home console VR, you know, and there needs to be your, uh, let's just call it competitive VR, right? So we are, we have been working on the last two years so our version of what the haptic, to, what the haptic suit should look like. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, but it's 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 been on it's been under development for about two and a half years now. Yeah, it's out of this world, you know. We we have. This is Ready Player One in yeah, Dubai, it, basically. We, basically. Um, our Bible, so our manifesto in the company was every single and every single employee that comes and works for us or team member or colleague needs to read Ready Player One. Not on the consensus that we are Ready Player One, but just that you need to understand, you know, this 
okay, before you can understand what you're what you're developing, because it all you know it all ties into to your own uh, it all ties into your own imagination. If you can't see yourself, like my, you know, as as most people as a pastime activity, they love to go to, for example, parties. Okay, now. Going to a party, a pre-recorded party, is like watching a concert on YouTube. Okay, you can't, you can't tell me, hey, here's a VR headset, let's go watch a party, a pre-recorded party that David Guetta was in some warehouse and he recorded it three years ago. I want to feel the energy. I want to feel the audience. I want to feel the heat. You know, I want to feel people's body. That's why I'm going to a concert. Now, if you can reenact that, you know, that's where you would start uh, having the desire for people to replace actual parties uh, or actual concerts with virtual uh, with metaverse concerts because it would technically be a real concert so wh when i uh, when i said digitize event space in one of our pro in all of our projects we have vcom sensors and ptz cameras and we have a, our own proprietary software and if you have a dj for example and this dj is playing inside the event space so he would be wearing a specialized suit and the audience would would not even be uh, it would it, okay so we would basically take the imagery of what's happening based on the suit and, and the performance and music and everything he's playing and then we would take him to a virtual arena okay and now the people would go watch him as their own avatar and they would be in that concert but in reality the concert is happening in real life yeah I mean it's it's in, you know what's so interesting about you guys most people start with the digital mm. and then they build out all the other stuff you guys started with the really hard things which is the <laughs> hardware <laughs> And now you're moving into the digital, and that's kind of unique. Exactly. Um, so and where we, wherever we find it complicated, we just get, you know, we, out, we, we get third-party companies. And, and it's all about the community, you know, helping each other grow. Because it's not, it's not my metaverse. It's not your metaverse. It's just the people's metaverse. It's, you're just giving them a, a, an escape. Well, Kareem Ibrahim, thank you so much for your time you're today. <laughs>